So, uh, I'm Liliana Andonova, Professor of International oh, Relations and Co-Director of the Center for International Environmental Studies here at the Graduate Institute. And as a host, I would very much like to extend a warm welcome. On behalf of the Graduate Institute, we are particularly pleased to host this event given our commitment to engage the world and Switzerland in events such as climate change and climate negotiations, which is extremely and growingly pertinent topic. And the speeches and ensuing discussions tonight will surely fit, or at least hope so, with our deeply entrenched values, namely our emphasis on independent thinking, uh, paired with a sense of solidarity and global citizenship and aspiration to make a positive impact on the world. And with these values in mind, uh, it is an honor to welcome such a distinguished panel and the keynote speaker. And thank, many thanks to Clean Tech for organizing this event and discussion. And without further ado, I would leave it to the organizers to engage us all. And thank you very much for coming. Debate is more important than anything in this place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Liliana. Hello, everyone. Please apologize for the delay, but as you will understand, we have important messages to portray, and the media plays an important role in portraying these messages. So we're very pleased that Paul made the time available, and we thank all of you for the delay. I'm extremely proud that many of you have, show, have shown up. My name is Nick Beglinger. On behalf of my team and our partners, I welcome you most warmly as well. And as uh, Liliana said, we have a great set of speakers tonight, so uh, get ready for a super uh, interesting evening. Before we go to our speakers, there's one guy who could not be here today. It's Bertrand Picard. He has set up Swiss Clean Tech together with me five years ago. And we've been saying since the five years that Swiss Clean Tech has been in existence that there is no dilemma between climate protection and economic prosperity. We've been saying that we need, even from a business point of view, a price on carbon that corresponds to a two degree uh, path. And we also said that for that, for this price on carbon, we need Switzerland to be a front runner and Switzerland to show other countries in the world how this is to be done. So, without further ado, a quick greeting from Bertrand Picard. Hello to everyone and thank you to Nick Beglinger for inviting me through the, through the film. I'm sorry I cannot make it in person, but it's a topic that is so important. Because if you noticed, we are at a crossroad now. In the past, we have heard a lot of politicians, head of state, people from economy and industry, recognizing that climate change is a problem. But saying it's a problem is not enough. Because when we say it's a problem, you have a lot of people who think the problem is too big, I can do nothing about it, so I better forget all about it. And then you have the one who come with targets. They say, okay, climate change is a big problem, but we have to solve it with targets. So we have the two degree question. We have the number of CO2 tons we have to save and, and so on. But if we speak of target and we don't speak of solutions, you have also a lot of people who will not take it seriously. It's not credible. You cannot speak about the target to reach if you don't explain to people how you will reach the target. So what we have to do now, and this is why I say it's a crossroad before COP21, that I deeply believe that we have to stop speaking about problems and targets to replace that type of discussion with the solutions we have. Because solutions we have already. We have them. They are profitable. They create jobs. They make profit, they sustain economical growth, and at the same time, they protect the environment. And this is about energy efficiency. It's about all the clean technologies that can save energy. We are now at a moment where we can replace old polluting devices by new clean technologies. And these are the decisions to be made. You know, if solar impulse is flying day and night with no fuel, it's not because of solar power. It's because of the energy efficiency of the airplane that is so high 
that only the little energy from the sun coming on our wings is enough to fly during the day, run for electrical motors, load the batteries in order to allow us to fly through the night, reach the next sunrise and continue with an unlimited endurance. This is actually what we need in our society, in our world. And if you speak to a country about reducing his development to protect the environment, you will lose him. If you explain to all the countries of the world which are now the solutions that increase energy efficiency, save energy, reduce CO2 emissions in order to open new markets, make profit, create jobs, and also protect the environment, by the way, you will win this country. And I believe this is the way we have to focus. Switzerland could be one of the leaders in that direction. This is why I think Swiss Clean Tech is right in organizing this big forum uh, that we have today. It's a really good thing. But the work doesn't stop at the end of this forum. The work starts at the end of this forum because you have to spread the word further and make a real difference with solutions. Thank you for that. And good luck. <laughs> well, I'll tell him. <laughs> Now, I'd like to introduce somebody I don't really need to introduce, somebody who is showing the world, not just talking, but showing the world with specific solutions, how to do it, how to be sustainable and be economically successful in the same time. I'm talking about Paul Pullman. He's the CEO of Unilever. For those of you who don't know, Unilever is a 50 billion uh, company. Uh, Unilever employs 170,000 people worldwide. And what impressed me most when doing the research, Unilever serves 2 billion people each day with their products. Imagine that. Imagine the impact that you can have if you serve 2 billion people each day. And above that, it's not even just the developed markets, but actually Unilever serves more of those people in developing countries. And I think that makes Paul an absolutely excellent keynote for us. I thank him most sincerely for being here with us. Paul, the floor is yours. I think I appreciate that, and certainly happy to be here. If we are slightly late, I apologize for that, but it's not only Swiss television, it's called the Pont de Mont Blanc. <laughs> and it's still the same, you know? And it's not getting better. Anytime I come here, traffic seems to be getting worse. This might be a deliberate strategy to get rid of cars in the city, which I don't necessarily disagree with, but then you have to provide a decent alternative. And uh, that alternative is becoming each time more expensive, I notice, when I take the tram. <laughs> it used to be that if you gave money, you never got your change back even, you know? Now they keep all your money. But anyway, uh, I'm happy to be here, and uh, thanks. I actually just came from the World Economic Forum. We had meetings, and exactly the meeting that I came out of is, is what do we need to do to be sure we get an ambitious enough agreement in Paris. Obviously, Bertrand is a good friend of mine, and I agree 100% with what he says. We need to decarbonize this economy. There's no doubt about it. But it's obviously a little bit more than that, because we also have to change a little bit the way we consume. If we keep cutting back the forests of this world, uh, at the same time going to uh, clean energy, we still will have a tremendous problem. The forecast is still that a, a country the size of India will be deforested if we continue on the current pattern. And, it was Gandhi who said, what we do to the forests of this world is a mere reflection of what we do to ourselves or one another. So there's a big opportunity. We also need to think about the way we consume. Uh, this whole concept of circular economy is a very powerful concept. I want to thank you for being here, because being here on a Friday night, when the weather is so nice, uh, when the fountain is going on the lake, you guys are real troopers. So you must be believing in the cause. You know, this is, uh, I hope you're not making this a habit by being every Friday night uh, in a in a room like this. But I want to thank the Swiss as well, because actually we are working on these INDCs, uh, which are these, um, as you well know, the intended national uh, determined uh, commitments that are coming in from each of the countries. The idea is that all the countries submit their commitments to Paris, if you want to, for the COP21 by October 1. Uh, today we have uh, 58 countries 
uh, if you include all the countries in Europe, 27 or 28 submissions if you take Europe as one country. And the indications so far are fairly positive versus what people would have expected two or three years ago. Undoubtedly, there will be people that want to be cynical or put a negative thing on there, but I can tell you, I'm actually fairly optimistic, we can talk that. We have moved the needle together with civil society, with business, with governments, with courage at the end of the day, much farther than people would have ever thought was possible at this point in time. We obviously need to work hard. I was a, a week ago in, in Brazil with uh, President Dilma because we need to get Brazil on board. We still don't have India on board. Some countries, we obviously want to see uh, a little bit more aggressive agreements. There is no doubt in my mind that we will get an agreement in Paris. Uh, that agreement is better than we've ever seen. Uh, certainly coming out of Copenhagen and other things. But the question, and obviously, is, is the agreement ambitious enough? And if it isn't ambitious enough, how do we ensure that there is a mechanism there, a mechanism of accountability, responsibility, a mechanism of continuous negotiations, a mechanism of preventing backsliding to ensure that we stay below the two degrees? And you're all familiar with the climate science. I don't have to talk about that. I think the chief effect that you're here is that you've bought into it. But let me just remind you, if you look at the, uh, uh, the reports uh, from the IPCC coming out on the climate science on the two degrees, the two degrees is still one third opportunity that it might be more. And, and uh, if you have a one third opportunity that you don't stay below uh, by being ca uh, carbon neutral at the end of the decade, uh, by the end of this century, I apologize, uh, that's still a high probability. Would you cross the road if you have a one-third probability to be hit by a car? Would you go in an airplane if you have a one-third probability that it would come down? I wouldn't. So what we're talking about here is still a high-risk thing, and we see it every day already around us. Uh, July was the hottest month in history. Twelve of the last 15 months, uh, 15 uh, years, have been the hottest on record. Climate change is here. In fact, the UN estimates that 2.7 trillion more has been spent over the last 10 years in mitigating disasters above the normal pattern. Climate change is here. And the two degrees that people talk about, this world doesn't work on average degrees. It's not a world that is anyway working on averages. We like to create great divides, including in incomes with people and poverty and richness. It's actually the Gini coefficient. It's going in the wrong direction. And the same is with climate change. Climate change is actually affecting far more the poor than the rich. The rich have resilience. The rich live in parts of the world that actually are less affected. But the two degrees average could be three or four degrees somewhere else. And if you live in the wrong part of the world, good luck, buddy. Good luck, buddy. What we're talking here about is not climate change, although that's the topic and the title. But what we're really talking here about is the human development agenda. It's no doubt in anybody's mind anymore that has spent enough time looking at these topics that what we're really talking about here is, is how can we create a global economic system that is more inclusive? How can we create a global economic system that is more sustainable? How can we create a global economic system that functions for all? We've clearly discovered in the crisis that we had in 20, 2007, 2008, that yes, we had lifted a lot of people out of poverty, but it had come at an enormous price. Government debt, private debt, enormous overconsumption, and frankly, leaving too many people behind. And climate change is actually a poverty agenda. When Hurricane Sandy hit the east coast of the United States, I have two sons who live in New York. You know, they had anecdotes. All of a sudden, they had to climb 50 stairs and felt cool about that, you know not having to go to the gym, but they had fun, you know. But the people in Haiti, besides the number of people that lost their lives, were pushed back by another three or four or five years in their recovery. We're talking here a human development agenda. And that's why it's not surprising that we are in a, in a very crucial year where three things come together at the same time. And we've crossed off two of them. One is the sustainable development agenda, absolutely crucial. Kovi Annan, who lives in this wonderful city, started in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals. And the Millennium Development Goals has a simple objective to halve the number of people living in poverty, at that time defined as $1.25 a day. We've achieved that. China has helped, but many other things. But we've learned a lot of things. 
many different things that we should now do differently because this world is a different world than it was 15 years ago. Much quicker economic development, moving power fields to the east and the south. Uh, consumption patterns are starting to hit our planetary boundaries. You're undoubtedly familiar with Johan Rockström, who runs the Resilience Institute in talk Stockholm, who talks about nine planetary boundaries. Used to be one, two, three. Now he's already talking about four planetary boundaries that he thinks are beyond what we would call the minimal acceptable levels. This world is being stressed. The biggest challenge we have actually is what I call the balance between man and nature. We've come to believe that we sort of dominate nature, but frankly, at the end of the day, nature will dominate us. If we continue to go on like this, we'll end up being one of these extinct species and it will only take 150 years for nature to come back. So the first thing that we have in its uh, essence this year is the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the follow-up of the Millennium Development Goals. Now, the good thing is it's now called Sustainable Development Goals because everybody understands that if we now have an objective to irreversibly eradicate poverty, that we need to do that in a more sustainable and equitable way. The 17 targets and 160, sorry, the 17 goals and 169 targets have sustainability and climate change written all over them. And the good thing is in September the countries will agree and in fact they already have agreed in preparation because it's only three weeks away that uh, we will be in New York for that. And I was a part of, uh, at the request of the Secretary General, uh, a part of the uh, high-level panel and I can tell you the initial discussions that we had with the 27 eminent members of that panel uh, I was the only business person and the first meeting they all looked at me because they clearly felt that I was part of, I was the problem uh, above anything else and uh, after two years of hard work together I think we got a fine piece of work out there that uh, we call leave no one behind that is basically the essence of what now we have as the Sustainable Development Goals. Then we had the financing for development in Addis, which was just in July. No system can work if we don't figure out how the financing works. You know that in your private life, the same happens in terms of our global system. And the financing is not quite working. We've discovered that just the simple ODA, Overseas Development Aid, is not changing much versus our expectations. If we want to attack climate change, if we want to implement the Sustainable Development Goals, we also have to agree on a financial agreement. Much more difficult, especially difficult at a time when economies are not so well functioning in Europe or the US. Governments are less willing to spend money on things outside of their countries, not popular for their constituents. But again, in Addis, we got a fairly decent progress that was being made on how the world's financial systems should contribute to this development agenda. So that's two wins. So we can't, min the we, uh, can't lose the third win, which is the win that we need to have in December in the COP21 uh, COP in Paris. And that's what we're all working on. Um, very simply, you tell me when my time is up, uh, Nick, because, uh, and I don't mind, I'm Dutch, you can tell me anything. <laughs> so the... Um, um, the main thing that, that got in the way uh, in moving this agenda forward, obviously, are many different factors. But the one thing was that some belief had crept in, especially in the political environment, that, that we need to grow uh, economies in order to have job creation, in order to create that wealth that we've all become accustomed to. And you cannot really... Uh, grow your environment if at the same time you have to tackle climate change. That was sort of the accepted belief. So we created this new commission for the environment, uh, which is a new commission for the economy, which was chaired by uh, Felipe Calderon, the former president of Mexico. Uh, Nick Stern was on that committee, myself and many others, and I hope you have some opportunity to see some more of these commission members uh, in the coming year. And we basically showed that this, this is a fallacy. If you, uh, that there is no trade-off between growing the economy and taking care of your natural resources, in this case, climate change. In fact, it's the opposite. If you don't attack climate change, you will not be able to grow. Technology has developed tremendously, and that is a big enabler. And the other one, obviously, is that we've let it come to such a point that the cost of not acting is rapidly starting to become higher than the cost of acting in many of these areas. So we're at a sweet point that actually we can show that these numbers work. And I will not go into the details of this report. The first report actually was called Better Development, 
better growth, better climate in that sequence. Just like Bertrand was saying on this video, you need to talk to people about the positive story about that. The new climate economy report basically came to the conclusion that there are three big buckets of where climate change is happening and that is what we need to focus on. One is land use, other one is energy, and the other one is uh, cities. Uh, the amount of urbanization that is going on is enormous. And let me just give you the statistic. In today's world we have 7 billion people and slightly less than 50% live in cities. So that's three and a half billion people living in cities. In the coming 30 years, we will move this world to nine billion people. Nine billion people and 70% will live in cities. So three billion people more are going to live in cities. Nearly as many as currently live in cities. That means that we need to build eight New Yorks every year. Now you've been to New York. By the way, if you live in Sao Paulo, it's the same more or less. Eight Sao Paulo's. That's tremendous. As a result, we need to make investments in infrastructure over the coming 15 years. In fact, people estimate that the global world needs to commit about $90 trillion over 15 years, which is $6 trillion a year in infrastructure just to accommodate that move that is happening driven by this urbanization. Now we have, an, and that is, by the way, mainly happening in the emerging markets. So the emerging markets have an opportunity, just like the mobile phone, to leapfrog by doing it right. If they make the wrong decisions and keep going as business as usual, like we've done to some extent in this part of the world, perhaps out of ignorance, if they continue to go on the same way, we're in deep trouble. In fact, they will pay the price for it more than we will. That's not an alternative. It's a zero alternative. So what we're advocating is then invest that money in a smart way. And you'll see that when we get a little bit more explanation uh, on the report itself. And in this case, we're at the point that you can, eat, you can have the cake and eat it too. It's a wonderful situation to be in. But we need to be smart how we invest in that. The new Climate Economy uh, Commission has come out with a second report that basically shows that if we collectively, collaboratively, between private and public sector, with the help of civil society, work together, we can actually close that gap over the next 30 years to about uh, f between 57 and 95 percent, more or less, thus is what we need to do to stay below the two degrees. The gap that will be there still, undoubtedly will be filled over time by some other technology that isn't available today. So my point is very simple. We can solve it if we want to solve it. It really takes human willpower and actually the only thing that we're missing right now, I can make it more complex, in my opinion, is leadership. Now, we've seen a tremendous change uh, in, in the business community, which I supposedly represent, but I always remind people first and foremost, I'm a citizen of this world and I'm a father of three children. I'm doing this because I care. I don't want to miss the opportunity to tell future generations we really screwed it up and I was to blame for it. At least I want to say, I, you know, we gave it all. We might not have solved all of the problems, but we at least put it back on track. I like to be part of a generation in these coming 15 years that can say, yes, we irreversibly eradicated poverty and we solved these issues at least of climate change so you don't have to deal with it anymore. So that we leave a world that is better for generations to come. And I think that's our minimum responsibility, irrespective of companies you work for or parts you have in society. I'm fortunate enough to represent Unilever, and that's my only spiel about this company, this wonderful company I work for, that uh, touches more than two billion consumers a day. And I've been thinking a long time when I took this job after I worked for Nestle as their CFO and running the Americas, and I took this job about seven years ago now, I've been thinking about why would I take it and frankly one of the things that was very appealing to me is if you are in 190 countries, if you uh, touch 2 billion consumers a day, how can you use that size and scale, which is frankly bigger than any government in the world, how can you use that size and scale to actually drive positive change? We put a business model out there which we call the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan which totally decouples our growth from environmental impact across the total value chain. We don't go like CSR only in our own shop. 
And we obviously now move it further and say, how can we use our business insights to create transformational change? What we're now working on with the business community at large, there are people here in the audience from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. We have the World Economic Forum. We have the UN Global Compact, all representing organizations that represent 30, 40,000 businesses. The World Business Council, which actually is located in this building, by coincidence, has over 30,000 regional or local members. The UN Global Compact has 8,000 members. So how do we use the WEF, the World Business Council, the UN Global Compact to rally the business community and make them part of this? After all, in the world, 60% of the GDP comes from business. 80% of the financial flow now comes from business and 90% of the job creation comes from business. And we created these coalitions the Low Carbon Technology Partnership Initiative, the Lima Paris Action Agenda, the Caring for Climate Initiatives. And the meeting we had this afternoon was exactly that. How can we organize ourselves even better than we do today to get more scale behind the initiatives that we're working? That we get a broader involvement from the business community and that we create the momentum to go from here to Paris. I was with Laurent Fabius, who has personally taken charge of the file for Paris, as, although he's very busy as foreign minister. He's personally taken charge uh, to ensure that the agreements are the best we can get. And uh, I was with him on Wednesday the whole day because he had invited all his ambassadors there for the journée d'ambassadeur or whatever he called it, and to be sure that the whole diplomatic core was singing in the same direction. And what was very clear for us is that uh, the uh, events that are going to happen in Paris will have involvement, enormous involvement from civil society, from the business community, as well from the governments, but to show that this enormous demand that is there to solve this issue. We saw the same in Paris last year in September when the Secretary General organized the climate summit. We had 175 CEOs there actually more than heads of state. I don't think there'd ever been so many CEOs to the UN in the first place. And yet they all signed up to these um, statements on the price for carbon, etc. And it sent a very, very strong signal to many heads of state who probably had been a little bit absent or who had delegated it to environmental ministers that might sometimes not be even in their cabinets. And the most important people that you actually need to have been excluded quite often are finance ministers. So we've made with this report from the NCE that you will see, we've made a special effort to reach out to many of the key finance ministers in the world. So where are we now, the last minute? We are now very close to Paris. We're trying to get business not only to make broad statements, but to get clear commitments. We have reached out to some of the countries still that need to deliver uh, their targets so that they come in with something that is very ambitious. And we're obviously creating this momentum together with civil society by keeping the heat on. We need four or five things from Paris, and I want to keep it very simple. We need to be sure that the politicians come in with a clear commitment for net zero emission. Some people say by the end of the century. That's probably the best we can get from Paris as it looks right now. I've made many statements and I've written about it. Many times you need it by 2050. But let's get not bogged down to this. It's far more important that we get a net zero emission statement. We put big uh, pressure on, on the G7, and the G7 came out with a net zero emission statement, thanks to the courage of Angela Merkel, as you might remember. The second thing we need from Paris is a price on carbon. We will not get one price in Paris. They will not agree with that. But the commitment that we get a price on carbon is the minimum we should ask for. What you don't measure, you don't treasure. We should, as a third point, ensure that there is a financing mechanism, not only to implement the plans that we need, but also the resilience plans that we need for the countries that cannot only help themselves. We should ensure that it is an agreement that has clear accountability responsibility, ideally legally binding, a big sticking point now with some countries who don't want the legally binding agreements but we should push for, as a minimum, accountability responsibility. And we should insist that every five years, as a minimum, there is a review on where we are and how we can get higher. 
without allowing backsliding, which means that any commitment that is being given now is the minimum commitment from where we move forward to. The good thing is, believe it or not, that China will be the next uh, uh, chairmanship of the G20, and we're actively working this already. And China has put high on the agenda the green growth. Not surprisingly, because it's the first country that actually has understood that their limits to growth are actually restricted by planetary boundary limits. And if China cannot grow and create the wealth that we've all become accustomed to in our parts of the world, their system itself is in question. They've put financing high on the agenda. We see momentum from the financial industry coming up, and we're working that on this momentum. This is what we want from Paris. I don't want to say much more. I believe uh, we will get an agreement that gets to about 30, 40% of what we are, some, what we need. Some people will say that's very disappointing. I don't want to put you in that mindset. I think that would be the wrong mindset. I'd say great that we have the 30 to 40%. Great that the whole world comes in with one agreement. Great that is linked to human development. And great that everybody has agreed, recognizing that we still have some years to deal with this problem, that everybody has agreed to continuously review and put the standards higher. And my question to you, or my request to you, is very, very simple. Use the last few months, the 100 days, in fact, that we have to put the maximum pressure on our politicians because ultimately it's an intergovernmental process. My second request to you is, is a very simple notion of awareness. And that notion of awareness is that you actually belong to a very small part of the population that I call the lucky 2%. The lucky 2% went to university. The lucky 2% are more or less financially independent. The lucky 2% don't go to bed hungry. The lucky 2% did make it past the eights of five. The lucky 2% can live and work where they want, basically, although we all like to complain a little bit. My request to you is very simple. If you feel, do feel, like I do, that you belong to this lucky 2%, put yourself to the service of the other 98%. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Well, I, also, I think we all belong to the lucky 0.001% who heard you tonight, Paul. Thank you so much. It was really absolutely excellent. We're a bit time pressed, so I'll start. Uh, I'll, I'll immediately uh, like to switch over to our next uh, speaker. Very, very uh, uh, interesting for us to have Ipek Gensu here for us. By the uh, Ipek is from the new. Climate Economy Commission, and IPEC has been with the Commission since April last year. She has been the co-author of the new New Climate Economy Report, the one that was published in the year 2015, and we are very, very privi privileged that she gives us some details on this report now. IPEC, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick, for that uh, quick introduction. And thank you also on behalf of the new Climate Economy team for hosting us here, for hosting this series of three events. Um, thank you also to the Graduate Institute for having us here today. Um, and I'd also like to thank Paul for his great presentation and for his strong support towards the project since its start. And thank you all for being here as well. I'll now present some of the core findings of the Commission's two reports its flagship report, Better Growth, Better Climate, the New Climate Economy Report, which was released last September, and its second report, Seizing the Global Opportunity, Partnerships for Better Growth and a Better Climate, which was released last month. As Nick mentioned, I was the project manager and a co-author. I will present the core fr framework of last year's report briefly, which I expect some of you might be familiar with. I will then share the broad conclusions and recommendations of this year's report, and then go on to share the key findings from both reports to support the economic arguments in particular. I hope to be able to whet your appetite and leave you to further delve into the two reports and also our contributing papers, our country case studies. Just by way of background, New Climate Economy was, had its research conducted for the projects by eight leading global research institutions. And we had input from over 120 organizations for the two reports. 
The 28 global members of the Commission, while serving in a personal capacity, together with their teams, spent hours reviewing and providing feedback on the work. They include former heads of state and finance ministers, business leaders, heads of international institutions, such as the OECD, IEA, UNDP, among many others. The Commission was set up to explore the perceived dilemma between strong economic growth and fighting climate change. As Paul mentioned, our extensive work, which draws on evidence from around the world, to sh shows that this is a false dilemma, that countries at all income levels can build lasting economic growth following a low carbon path. This has been made possible, especially in recent years, by the structural and technological changes unfolding in the economy and opportunities for greater efficiency. The report looks at evidence from three key systems where it's possible to achieve better, more sustainable growth. These are cities, land use, and energy systems. It also highlights three key drivers of better growth. These are resource productivity, infrastructure, and innovation. Now, this year's report also builds on this three by three work framework, looking at recent developments and opportunities in these key sectors and drivers. It also looks at some other key sectors of the economy where there are strong economic opportunities and a clear need for urgent climate action. The main conclusions of this year's report are the following. The report found that there are a number of changes occurring in the global economy which are already building momentum towards a low carbon transition. It also found that through cooperation and partnerships among governments, cities, businesses, civil society and others, it's possible to catalyze further climate ambition while also achieving significant economic benefits. The report makes 10 headline recommendations. Analysis carried out for the Commission shows that if implemented fully, they can achieve up to 96% of the emissions reductions needed to stay on the internationally agreed two degree limit. And finally, the global level of ambition on climate change can be raised significantly in economically beneficial ways. Countries, INDCs, as Paul mentioned, that are being published, and I know Switzerland has led the way, um, actually should be seen as floors to ambition and certainly not ceilings. They can be ratcheted up through following these actions in a cooperative way. So just to look at some of the emerging global trends and opportunities that show momentum building up. Clean energy investment, for example, has grown rapidly in recent years. $270 billion were invested in renewables in 2014, and at least $130 billion in energy efficiency. In 2013, for the first time, the world added more low-carbon electricity capacity than fossil fuel capacity, and we hope that the trend will continue. Another important trend is that the cost of clean technologies are coming down drastically. Solar PV modules are about 80% cheaper than they were in 2008, and wind turbine costs also continue to fall rapidly. Solar and wind can now compete with fossil fuels with low or no subsidies in more and more places. And just to give you a final example of the momentum building up, we can see that global economic growth and CO2 emissions are beginning to be decoupled. For the first time in 40 years, in 2014, global GDP grew by 3%, while emissions did not. So there are a number of significant indicators, and we can see that there is momentum building up. But we have to act quicker, we have to increase ambition, and continue to reduce emissions even faster than we do now. This year's global report makes recommendations in 10 key areas where international collaborative action can accelerate progress and generate economic benefits. These are, in the three key systems which I highlighted, the Commission recommends to accelerate low carbon development in the world's cities, to restore and protect agricultural and forest landscapes and increase agricultural productivity, to increase clean energy investment to $1 trillion per year by the time we reach 2030, and raise energy efficiency standards to the global best. For the three main drivers of economic growth, 
the Commission recommends to implement effective carbon pricing to maximize resource efficiency, ensure the infrastructure that is being built, the new infrastructure, is climate smart and climate resilient. This is an important point because, as Paul mentioned, there's going to be $90 trillion of investment, um, infrastructure investment being made in the three key systems over the next 15 years. So the decision we make whether to lock it in a high carbon development path or a low carbon path is critical. And finally, we need to galvanize low carbon innovation, which will lead to the technological breakthroughs that will become future game changers. In the apologies, I um, went a bit too quickly, but just to go over the critical business and finance sectors, the Commission recommends to drive low carbon action through business and investor action, which will help, among many other things, overcome competitiveness concerns. And finally, for other key sectors where we have the potential to unlock cost efficient emission savings, the recommendations are to raise ambition to, introduce, to reduce international aviation and maritime emissions. Currently, they are not part of countries' national emissions, so they get left out, and we can be more ambitious. And finally, phase down the use of hydrofluorocarbons. These were put in place to replace the ozone-depleting CFCs, you may remember, from the 90s, and they did a very good job, but unfortunately, they're the fastest-growing greenhouse gases and need to be curbed. The analysis conducted for the Commission shows that if, if all implemented, these actions can achieve up to 96% of the emissions reductions that we need. Business as usual is leading us to a path up to 90, 69 gigatons by 2030. But to make sure we stick to the two degree scenario, we need to be much lower than that. Each recommendation, if fully implemented, can lead to significant emissions reductions. And together, they can almost close the gap. I will now go over in detail some of these recommendations, highlighting the key economic findings in both this year's and last year's reports. In cities, the Commission recommends that cities commit to implementing low carbon development strategies by 2020, prioritizing public and low emissions transport, building efficiency, renewable energy, and efficient waste management. Cities across the world are demonstrating more compact, connected urban development. Such an approach can reduce infrastructure capital requirements by more than $3 trillion over the next 15 years. Moreover, investing in low-carbon development in cities could save around $17 trillion globally by 2050. Now, this is equivalent to 20% of the global infrastructure investment needs, which I mentioned, for the next 15 years. And it's based on energy savings alone, this figure. It does not take into account wider social benefits, such as improved healthcare gains due to improved air quality and avoidance of hours wasted in traffic, which we are very much aware of. Through international collaborative initi initiatives, such as the Compact of Mayors, over 100 cities have already signed up to common commitments. Just to quickly demonstrate the different alternatives that are possible, we have the examples of Atlanta and Barcelona here with similar population size, similar areas, but their carbon emissions are very different. And in fact, uncontrolled sprawl in the US alone exceeds, the cost is, exceeds $1 trillion per year, which is around 2.6% of its GDP. In energy efficiency, the Commission recommends that G20 and other countries converge their energy efficiency standards in key sectors to the global best. G20 countries, for example, produce 94% of vehicles, and a potential shift in, in these could have a huge impact on energy efficiency and emissions levels. Increasing energy efficiency could boost cumulative economic output by $18 trillion by 2035. Currently, a lot of the energy efficiency potential remains untapped. As you can see, there is, those are the bars in different industries, transport, power generation and buildings, and there is much more room to go, as you can see from the shaded area. Carbon pricing. The Commission sees carbon pricing as a key tool 
for attaining resource efficiency. It recommends that all developed and emerging economies commit to introducing and strengthening carbon pricing by 2020. Many people see it very, as very challenging, but you can see that 40 countries and 20 subnational governments regions have adopted or are planning carbon pricing already. More than a thousand businesses and investors have signaled their support for it. I think I've got uh, only a few minutes left, so I will quickly skip through um, this very interesting slide which shows just very visually the difference between the fossil fuel subsidies and the renewable subsidies, which also is an important matter that the Commission recommends we address. And um, encouragingly, due to the low oil prices, 28 countries have actually launched fossil fuel subsidy reform. And finally, to end on business. Business, which has a cross-cutting role and is at the heart of economic activity in all three sectors and drivers of growth. The Commission recommends for businesses to adopt short and long-term targets consistent with the long-term decarbonisation of the economy. There is a great deal of momentum building and more than half of the Fortune 100 companies are investing in many efficiency measures which lead to $1.1 billion per year of savings for them. The financial sector is also doing, paying greater attention to climate change, investigating and incorporating climate risk into their activities. And investors with half of total institutional assets are signed up to the UN principles for responsible investment. And finally, tackling climate change is actually a huge business opportunity, a market worth $5.5 trillion in 2011 and increasing rapidly. But there is more to do, and it's possible to do this through collaboration. Unfortunately, only few businesses have set targets that are in line with a 22 degrees pathway. It is possible to do this in a more efficient way through collaboration. And there are, there are a number of initiatives accelerating progress. We group these initiatives in three main types. First, there are the ones that focus on establishing targets or common commitments and standards, such as the science-based targets, the RE100 initiative. Second, there are ones which seek to catalyze the low-carbon transformation of specific sectors, of value chains, technologies, and products to ensure a critical mass of companies are on board building economies of scale and shifting demand. And finally, there is a rise in business-led climate advocacy. New coalitions are calling for clear and stable long, low carbon policy signals and they want them to guide investment and innovation decisions. It is too soon to, to know how successful some of these initiatives will be, but a lot of them are making huge strands already and definitely changing the signals that the business is giving to governments, to international institutions, which is definitely a very big part of the change. Just to conclude quickly, I've given you a very brief taster of the main points of our report. The key argument that you will take away from here today is that looking at evidence around the world, we have shown that there is no dilemma that lasting economic growth and climate action are compatible. There are a number of changes occurring globally which are building momentum and show that this transition is starting to happen, but it needs to get faster. And strong action, collaborative action in these 10 key areas I quickly highlighted can get us there. And cooperation between governments, cities, business, civil society and many others will be a big part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ipek. Thanks for your details and your energy and for being on time. Can I just ask you to uh, sit down? Paul, would you mind coming up as well, sitting here? And uh, We start our panel now, uh, and I'm delighted to welcome our three new panelists. Please come and join us here. So this will be Paul, this will be Ipek, if that's okay with you. I will go here. Mona is here, Matthias in the middle, exactly. Okay. Super. Thanks so much to everyone. I'd like to 
start right out uh, by the lady sitting uh, to my right, Simona Scarpaleggia. Uh, Simona is the CEO of IKEA Switzerland. Simona has been with uh, IKEA Switzerland for five years. She's Italian. She's been with IKEA for 15 years with a bit of HR background, but studying international relations, right? Um, so I would like to thank you that you're here on the panel, and I would like to ask you straight away, why are you doing this? Why are you here? Yeah. And what makes IKEA, which is also a global company, 300 plus stores, 30 countries, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, what makes IKEA a leader in sustainability? Yeah. Thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me. Uh, why I'm here? Well, we all know and we heard so beautifully before that. Uh, um, the climate change and the growing population are the two burning topics, uh, uh, one of the most, uh, two of the most important ones. And they cross paths with uh, uh, other mega trends like urbanization or, um, you know, the, the digital revolution. So this already uh, set uh, a scene where we see clearly that a change is needed. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, by uh, observing and, and, and uh, considering that uh, it's individuals, companies and institutions are part of, of the problem, then the good news is also that individuals, institutions and companies are also part of the solution. So we can do something. And we uh, address at IKEA sustainability in a broad sense. And this is what I would like to share today. Not tonight, just on forests. Us. Not just on forests. We, we address it uh, on a broad sense, uh, uh, which touches environment, uh, communities and the business. And uh, to us, uh, sustainability, it is about uh, uh, caring and uh, positively acting for the environment. It is about caring and positively acting for uh, communities and people. And therefore, it's also uh, caring and positively acting uh, for the company, for the business. And that's what I would like to share with you today, maybe with more details. Thank you very much, Simona. Then I would like to introduce an additional panel member, Matthias Bölke. Uh, Matthias is the CEO of Switzerland for a company called Schneider Electric. Schneider Electric, I'm reading this off, has a $25 billion turnover, 150,000 staff worldwide, and is active in 130 countries. Now, uh, Matthias, I must say, is also a board member of Swiss mm -hmm. CleanTech, so I know mm -hmm. a little bit more about uh, Matthias, and he knows a lot more about me. But, um, you know, Schneider Electric is, is dealing on so many fronts with sustainability. Could you tell us why you are here, and could yeah. you tell us what makes Schneider Electric special in sustainability? Well, and this was not all the time like that. You know, we were, I would say, 10 years ago in the company, we, we sold motors, transformers, electrical stuff, and we sat together in 2005 and we said, okay, we, what, what is the next strategy for the company? And we decided to invest each and every cent and reinvest each and every cent to just one topic, which is energy management. In these days, uh, basically with the aim of energy efficiency. So, and get, guess what, in, in the last six years we doubled the company. We are, as you said, 20, 20 billion company now. So that's, that's, that's huge and it was a very, very rush and interesting uh, way and uh, now what we are doing now we are and that's why I love this company that I work for we are enabling so we are a multiplicator we are selling products software services to our customers and they are then in place to reduce their footprint to reduce their energy consumption to reduce their costs and this is high, high tech today it's a really transform transformation in, in, in this in this company and giving now the possibility really to be a multiplicator, and this is just great. But you're also a public company, right? Uh, right. So, so being a public company brings some advantages and some disadvantages, particularly on the short-term performance. Uh, so how do you sort of bridge that, uh, being public and having to perform short-term while wanting to, to be sustainable? On the well, you better, you, you better perform well, right? It's true. You better be a healthy company when you want to, to drive really new things. You, you, you better be in good shape. So, uh, and you're right, each quarter we have to deliver our financial results to, the, to, uh, to, to these guys and, and, and we are, you know, under the loop, let's say. But what we are doing as well, and this since ten, 10 years, we are also giving them each quarter 
what we call a um, um, planet and society barometer, where we are displaying our own way, uh, let's say, to, to, to be a green champion, where we're showing what is our uh, CO2 reduction, what is our energy reduction, how we are treating our, our, our suppliers to be compliant with all the new rules we have to put in place. So this is something uh, we're giving them as well each quarter, and we are running this since 2005. So this is each each new company program, and it's always a three-year company program. We're just starting this now into 15 to 17. We start at, at a new level, right? So uh, so the, the, the people in the company are quite, you know, also busy to meet those goals each time because we have already done a lot of things. And uh, basically now, for instance, now where we are today, the aim is in the next three years to reduce um, to reduce 10% uh, carbon, uh, to put 10% energy efficiency in our plants where we did already a lot of, of stuff. So this is more and more demanding, but also more and more challenging. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, mm -hmm. and the outside of the world is looking at this as on our financial reports. And I think this gives value to the company. Mm. It's not only the financial, the financial figures, it's also the way to show we are green as well. We are not only enabling them, but producing this also in our own, in our own company. It's a big value, mm -hmm. and it's a short-term value. It's not only to be you know, uh, long-term, it's each quarter. So there is no dilemma. There's no dilemma. I think it's part of it. If you are in good shape in business, you can be good, in very good shape as well in, in, in sustainability and in, in plans and targets you have for, for Simona, is there a dilemma? The, is there, the, is there the a dilemma? Planet. I strongly believe that there is no dilemma. I think we should talk more, more about the fact that there is no dilemma. Um, we see, for instance, we ran a very interesting project uh, in Switzerland uh, involving families of our customers and also of our co-workers in living a better and more sustainable life at home. And uh, now we, we are just measuring the result over six months and they're already decreased uh, up to 50% of their energy consumption. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of just you know, spending money in order to be um, less impactful on the, uh, on the planet, but it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It's a win-win. So uh, I strongly believe we should definitely go in that direction. Very good. Thanks very much. I'd like to come to our third panel member, Professor Liliana Andonova. Uh, you've met Liliana at the very outset of this talk. You were uh, uh, resident here, you're, you're a professor of public policy and I, you've been here for seven years already. I'd like to ask you, if you hear those companies, you know, we heard Schneider Electric, we heard IKEA, we heard Unilever, is it enough if the companies go ahead or is it also necessary for, you know, for, for, for governments to do, to do action? That's sort of my, my most important question. But also I'd like to know why are you here and what is the Graduate Institute doing to make it really sustainable? Uh, I'm the political scientist here, not making any millions. And so I suppose my role here is to uh, pose difficult questions. Um, so the Graduate Institute is doing a lot of work on climate change. And in reality, that's why I'm here. And we have done, for example, we have inquired into what is the level of access to clean energy for those 98% that Paul was speaking about. We were, developed a project looking specifically at clean energy access by, uh, in developing countries, in impoverished regions, mm -hmm. and the diffusion of clean technologies that could make this uh, climate and uh, development very compatible. And we found first that there is a dearth of data, there is very limited understanding, and I think that prevents the debate to reach at the highest level of negotiation. Secondly, some technologies diffuse much more readily, light bulbs are diffused like nothing else contributing to uh, uh, more efficient economies. Other technologies are facing huge hurdles in important countries that are on paper taking initiatives uh, uh, such as Indonesia, for example, the Philippines, they have made huge achievements, but there is this tremendous more, especially bringing these achievements down to the ground level. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. this is some of the research contributions that we have uh, made here at the Graduate Institute, but mm -hmm. I'm more interested in the bigger picture as far as this panel goes. Uh, we have argued for a long time that for action to start taking place internationally and domestically, the development agenda and the climate agenda have to be made compatible. Okay, and there seems to be a, a very nice agreement on this panel. 
but somehow, in the international rhetoric, this is not happening quite yet, not sufficiently. And my concern here is to find out how can we close the political gap. I mean, it is, it is absolutely fantastic that large companies are gearing up uh, to push that agenda economically, because that's the, the, the fundamentals. Uh, but what else do we need to do in terms of organizing society mm -hmm. uh, to close the political gap? We have lack of leadership and lack of sufficient political demand given even for things that are completely compatible and win-win. Can I put this question to Paul? Thank you very oh. much, Paul. How do we close the political gap? Is there a political gap and how do we close it? Well, if I were the only one having the answer, we probably would have closed it already. So, um, there, there, I, I agree with your point that there is probably sometimes a lack of understanding and having more people sit together and listen to each other with some leadership working for the common good instead of their own would actually help. Uh, the biggest um, challenge that is there uh, uh, right now between the SDGs and the COP 21, although there are far more similarities than differences, so I don't want to make this sound that it's actually uh, uh, two separate tracks. This is really one track uh, as much as you can get it. But there is a main concern, especially amongst the developing countries, that still really need to see a lot of economic growth, that the normal overseas development aid, or the 0.7%, as a lot of countries call that, and many countries have not delivered on that, mm. that that would not be delivered. There's an enormous worry that some of the money that has been pledged will be double counted. Uh, mm -hmm. So how do you ensure that, that the uh, developed world also takes financial responsibility? We should not forget that the issues of climate change, for which I have a lot of sympathy, were created in these parts of the world. Mm -hmm. They weren't created in Africa. Mm -hmm. So in order to help these people, not only help them do the right things, like you've eloquently explained, but also we need to be sure that we pull through with the financing mechanism. And the main debate right now is obviously on how do we do that and how do we ensure that people are held accountable for delivering. A good example is the Red Plus funds. We commit 100 billion for the Red Plus funds, but not a very limited money has been given still. Mm -hmm. And obviously uh, it's a tick for tack discussion. You, we don't know if you will deliver, we don't know if you will uh, bring the money in, but we, on the other side, we don't know if you will actually perform. And we need to create a higher space for trust first and foremost, a little bit more courage to unlock some of those funds. I think that will be the, the biggest debate uh, in Paris, mm -hmm. uh, and especially coming from the G77, and we have to be having a little sympathy for that. For that same reason, we have to have sympathy, not time necessarily, for industries that will be obsoleted. You know, it is, we should not be surprised that if you are in a total fossil industry, mm -hmm. because you're saying before, are there trade-offs or are there no trade-offs? I agree with both Schneider and Ikea, who, by the way, are wonderful companies moving this forward at an enormous pace, uh, that you can do a lot of things without trade-offs. And that's obviously what we should be doing, like we can all do. We can all brush our teeth and turn off the tap. Mm -hmm. We can all turn off the lights when we go home. We can take the lowest carbon transport options. There's a lot of things we can all do. And the same is true in business. But the reality is some things still cost money. If you are in the coal industry and you have your coal plants running, and coal right now is the cheapest form of energy, it's the cheapest form of energy because you don't pay for your externalities. Mm -hmm. The $50 per ton that makes coal very cheap should actually be as a minimum $200 per ton if you take into account the cost only on air pollution. Mm -hmm. in, in China, 1.6 million people a year lose their lives to air pollution. In, in uh, 650,000 in India, even in the UK where I spent most of my time, 39,000 people lose their lives to air pollution. <laughs> And now, the beauty now is of the internet, and we are living in the age of transparency, we can see all these costs, and we can see what these trade-offs are. But sometimes these trade-offs are borne by different people. Mm -hmm. So one has the free and low carbon, and the other pays the price for health. And those are enormous trade-offs, and we need to help. We need to help industries decarbonize themselves with transition plans, with financial incentives, and we need to manage governments to deal with these trade-offs. So you would agree that we need business action, but we need also government action. As part of government action, we need funds, but we also need a price on carbon. 
Oh, absolutely. Without the price on carbon, I don't think you will solve anything long term. Yeah. And I always say very simply, uh, I don't know if I mentioned that, but as long as we value a dead tree more than a tree alive, we're in trouble. Yeah. And uh, Andre is sitting here, and that is definitely, I think the WWF understands that more than anybody, and they fought for that day and night, and their last uh, reforestation deforestation report is worth reading. We have Andre Hofmann of WWF, the president of WWF International, and the vice president of Roche. So, so you Thank need you. to put a price on carbon. The issue is you cannot just put a global price on. The world is way too complex. And to think that there is a global market all of a sudden for carbon mm. is ridiculous. We need to use the global institutions to at least have a minimum price, which in our company we use $50. Mm -hmm. uh, some people would say $30. Uh, by the way, there are already 40 countries and 26 uh, different regions that already have prices on carbon or are experimenting with that. People say, for example, you might not know, but California has a price on carbon. Mm -hmm. Jerry Brown was one of the first ones mm -hmm. to do that. In China, there are many districts with a price on carbon. So it's actually happening. We're getting some experience on that. Can we use the OECD and the IMF, the World Bank, and others, obviously, on a global level, to create actually mechanisms to have a minimum price that should be aggressive enough, but then obviously goes up over time. So Unilever has a $50 price, on an uh, internal price on, on, on carbon, and you account for all of it, I assume. Well, our model goes further because we want to be totally carbon neutral. Yes. And I'm saying that because uh, one of our great brands is Ben & Jerry's, and so if you can, my point is always to people, if you can make ice cream carbon, carbon neutral, <laughs> you can make anything carbon neutral. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, for, for the same reason, we run our factories at zero waste. Yeah. People say it's not possible until you do it, and then it's all of a sudden possible. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so we need to set these bars high, uh, and, yep. and in order to do that, you need to incentivize your system internally. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there will be indeed trade-offs. Mm -hmm. So if you put an internal price there, it's mm -hmm. easier for the people that actually have to do the work, which often is not myself, mm -hmm. uh, to actually be able to do that. To do that yeah. uh, whilst otherwise, they might not be able to handle these dilemmas. That, yeah. I'd like to know from IKEA and Schneider, do you guys have a price on carbon as well? Do you account for, for carbon? Maybe Matthias, you start? Y yes, we do, of course. And, and if you see the... What is it? Hmm? What is it? Is it 50? Is it 60? Is you, it 40? You mean the amount? Dollars. 55. 55, okay. <laughs> is this a problem? It's, no, no, it's not. <laughs> not at all. You know what? You be Unilever. You know what? If... if, if uh, why, why we are sitting? I mean, it's unbelievable. We are sitting here. We are in a nice country. We are here in Switzerland, and so on. So we we have nice debates. If we see uh, uh, if we see our our electrical consum consum here in Switzerland is over forty percent goes to buildings. If we see how we still today we are building our buildings, we are what architects are doing, what planners are doing, how we how we do installation in buildings. It is unbelievable what we are doing because we are still producing things which are not at all at the level where it could be, right? And, uh, and, 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 and this is about technology. And that's why I love, Nick, I love what we are doing in Swiss Clean Tech, an association where we are bringing together people which are technology freaks. It is about technology. And we are here in Switzerland. We are a country with, which could push all this technology, which is important to, to, to all those new buildings we have to build. Yeah, and we are doing this not enough, I think. Yeah. So, so, um, so there's good reason for a good price. The, there's, there's good reason for a good Can price. I ask, see, see, Simone, just yeah, quickly, what, what do we do? What, what do we do? do? We calculate from uh, the um, sourcing of raw material to home-to-home -home, uh, delivery of the product throughout the whole supply chain, the carbon, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, and then we, of course, do actions in order to decrease them. Uh, to give you just a, a, a figure, from uh, fiscal year 10, since we started calculating that, to fiscal year 14, so the last uh, fiscal year closed, we decreased it by 24%. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are highly focused, one of the three p pillars of our strategy is the energy consumption. We decided to go uh, by 2020 uh, totally energetically independent. Mm -hmm. And, um, and uh, Switzerland, of course, yes, Switzerland is aligned with that. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, since 2010, we started investing heavily in solar panels and in um, uh, windmills. Mm -hmm. uh, Switzerland, for instance, all our stores are um, energetically provided by solar panels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we decreased uh, since, uh, a year, in, since last year already 14% in mm -hmm. energy consumption. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. No, I want to add, though, can I, can please, I say one more? Because, please. And I'm not saying that because you're on the panel. But IKEA has made a commitment, and they're actually doing it, to spend $1 billion on clean, clean energy. We see the same now with Apple. We see the same with, uh, with uh, Google and actually a lot of the, the cloud companies. But to spend $1 billion, I would challenge any government who spend $1 billion with that commitment well, on clean energy. I can even say and, something <laughs> And, and um, so it galvanizes, it doesn't only do the right thing for IKEA, but it galvanizes a lot of others to take a little bit more courage than they otherwise would. The other thing that IKEA has done with the IKEA Foundation is financing a lot of the efforts that are going on that we are working on to align the business community with an action called We Mean Business. Yeah. They've put generous money in there, and I want to thank them for that, because we would not be able to do that. It's very difficult nowadays to get money out of companies, I can tell you. It's worse than going to the dentist, which I have to do on Monday. <laughs> so the, uh, the, uh, the initiatives that these companies do is, if everybody would be doing that, I don't think we'd be sitting here. Yeah. Time flies, and I know Liliana needs to, to uh, catch an airplane, so I just want to uh, ask you a final question. If you are in, Sw uh, and I like to speak a little bit about Switzerland uh, and its role. You're here in Switzerland, you've done your PhD in, in, in Harvard. Could you sort of give us your view, your personal view? What, how do you see Switzerland in this game? Are we really such a, such a good guys? Are we, do, don't, shouldn't we sort of gear up a level and, and, and contribute more to the international process? So how do you see this, you know, Switzerland? Switzerland can always contribute more. I think, first of all, the energy policy that was adopted a couple of years ago was a landmark energy policy because you have one country that is an exemplar in terms of energy efficiency pledging to go significantly further, so both in terms of efficiency and in terms of technological innovation and in terms of cutting emissions, CO2 emissions. So even though for Switzerland, Theoretically, the marginal cost for doing that would be relatively high because it's already very efficient. Uh, it has committed to that, uh, and it r actually walks the talk. Uh, it does show that these two objectives are com uh, com compatible. It is one of the strongest economies in Europe. Uh, so this example, in my view, if it is played out sufficiently, could serve as a very important focal point uh, for the debate at the international level among major economies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and the second way in which Switzerland has a particular comparative advantage through its quiet diplomacy is to work to reframe the debate at the political level. And I would like to give you two examples. If you think about forest and climate change, in 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated, we had this unfortunate term, LULUSEF. Mm -hmm. You know what LULUSEF yes, is? Yes, yes. Everybody knows what LULUSEF is. Mm -hmm. But what it meant then is that countries are monitored and potentially penalized for forest-based emissions. Now we have red and red plus. I mean, the ingenious thing about RET, and it has many problems, it hasn't taken off yet. Uh, it, it needs to be worked out, implemented, financed. But, but, but the value of RED is it that turned the game around. No longer, th these countries, these c poor communities that live in tropical areas are not anymore the culprits, the evildoers that are polluting the earth. Mm -hmm. They're recognized for their stewardship forests, mm -hmm. uh, and that mechanism intends to put value on that stewardship uh, and to compensate these communities and to provide actual incentives to enlarge that stewardship and to draw on multiple sources of knowledge to advance protection of forests as a source of uh, decarbonization of the world and, uh, and, and better land management. So this is one critical example that needs to happen more often. Mm -hmm. We need a major reframing of the debate which looks at the incentives uh, for communities, countries, cities, business to play the carbon game. Mm -hmm. uh, a carbon tax or, or pricing of carbon is one way to go. But Switzerland has a particular role to play along with other countries given its experience to quietly, through quiet diplomacy, to uh, kind of promote frames that could be politically more progressive. Switzerland played a, a very important role, and Geneva in particular, in facilitating better climate financing agreement around Cancun here. Yeah. Uh, and so perhaps this is not a very widely known, but a series of meetings that took place in Geneva, and some of them were facilitated by the World Business Council, some of them were facilitated by the World Economic Forum, actually uh, 
help to create a much more substantial agreement on the financial facility. It's not enough, it's not perfect, but as Paul said before, it's a significant advance compared to what we had under the UNFCCC before. And, 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 and I'm glad that I'm in Switzerland because of this positive view on matters. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I think that's a super uh, last word from you. You have to rush to the plane. It's now 1930. Exactly. Thank Thanks so much. That's for also part of and let's the let, let, let's give you a big hand for being Thank here. You very much. We're going to continue for 10 more minutes because there's two issues. I would like Ipex view uh, just briefly on this on this price on carbon thing. It is a complex issue. We need to solve it in some way. And in Switzerland, we, we try to be a leader in this issue. Can you sort of try to do the impossible and tell me how could Switzerland, specifically on the price on carbon issue, bring this further? From your work, is there an angle we could take? What should Switzerland specifically do? Well, unfortunately, I'm going to give you the, the politically correct answer, which is the Commission's answer, which is that it's different for every country. And that's why the Commission doesn't um, give a certain price on carbon. Yeah. That's why we don't say uh, whether setting a price on carbon versus emission trading, what is right. The Commission is ag agnostic on these things. Mm -hmm. um, there are other mechanisms, such as carbon border adjustments, for example, which have been considered, but um, they're really seen as second best, because ultimately, uh, the economy would best function through collaborations led by the G20 and other leading countries by setting a price. And this price would have to be higher than the, the current EU price, of course, um, for our analysis in the Commission, for our mitigation analysis, which I showed you in the graph, we did use the price of $35 per tonne for developing countries and uh, $75 for developed countries. But this, is, um, this was just for our calculations purpose, purposes because politically it's impossible to state what countries should do. Of course, Switzerland, as a country that is leading in, in its field, in, in many fields such as innovation and technology, delivering its INDCs um, as a front runner, uh, should be aiming high, I would say. But Paul, please do add. No, the first thing Thanks. is, uh, this is well answered, so I don't add to it. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, we do need to realize that just putting a price on carbon is not the only solution. We're talking about a lot of things. Yes. But you need to get to net zero emission. If you just go and tax something, people will, some people will ultimately pay for it, but we cannot afford that. Mm -hmm. So we, whilst we are all very interested in the price on carbon, which I happen to 100% agree with, we have to do be mindful of the fact that that's not the main or the only solution to solve what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The second thing is you need to also be able to define things. When you put prices on things, you need to know what you put prices on. There's an enormous effort going on in the world right now to decide what, what is the carbon sinks, what is the, the price on the forests, how do we uh, define high carbon stock, how do we measure in countries the carbon. So if we want to price something, you need to first know what you need to price. Yeah, sure. So there's a lot of work that is going on in that area as mm -hmm. well. So we have to not do the cart before the horse. We just have to get the commitment from the member states in Paris and then uh, use these schemes that are already now there, the 40 national schemes and 26 regional schemes mm -hmm. to then expand. And that number needs to then go up at a certain pace. Mm -hmm. It will not be a price on carbon globally, but there isn't a price for shoes globally either, either. or a price for cars either. Yes. So we, I think we have to accept that, as long as it is something that is ambitious enough and goes up. Yes. Now, coming back to Switzerland, Switzerland, I wanted to say one thing, because I love Switzerland, I live here myself. So the, um, the thing that Switzerland underestimates with all the good things it's doing and it sets standards in many areas is an enormous market here for financing, which is Swiss product. And Switzerland has taken an unnecessary beat to some extent, in my opinion, in an industry that is its core competence. The market of green bonds only two years ago was 5 billion. The market of green bonds this year will exceed well over 50 billion. So being on the foreground of this catalytic financing, even in the private sector, is a tremendous opportunity. And I would like to see a country like Switzerland being really the leaders in this field. You have core competencies. Where are these type of financial services? Where are these? Where do you find the M&A guys? Where do you find the investment bankers? Where do you find the hedge funds? Where do you find the future, which is really 
in green financing, green bonds being the one that we expect. And that is why on the 10th of September there will be the second new climate economy Swiss event in Zurich focused on the finance industry. Excellent. Because we uh, totally agree uh, with, with this focus. We need to round off, but before we leave, I, I, I'd like Can to... Just add please just thing about sing the... Um, the, the role of Switzerland, because of course we need, we, 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 uh, according to me, Switzerland should be in the forefront. Uh, there is a very good ground of uh, people who are uh, interested and sensitive about the sustainability topic. There is a, a, a great financial uh, uh, ground because uh, this country is wealthy and there are the financial institutions, but also Switzerland is already an extremely innovative country. So we have here professionals and intelligence and competence to really make the further step. Mm. So I think their conditions are really optimal to be in the forefront in this field. I think it should be encouraging also for the government. Thanks very much, Simona, for this. I, I always like to hear, you know, on the, the, on the advantages of Switzerland, we also have a diplomatic tradition which yes. could be uh, used in this field, uh, obviously. But unfortunately, we need to close down. And I'd like to, as a final question to our two corporate representatives, ask where, what are, you, where are you going to be uh, in, in December? Are you going to be in Paris? And what is Schneider Electric specifically doing uh, uh, at COP21? Yeah, of course we are there. We have. Are you there? We, we. I will not be there, but I, maybe I will be there. It's not planned you so should far. Be there. I should be there. Yeah, mm. but we have a lot of people. We have a lot of people over there. We have a huge building over there with two thousand people sitting in, which is the most energy efficient building in Paris, by the way, called the Hive. If you have a possibility to visit this, go there. It's very interesting. So we have a lot of people there. Uh, panels, discussions, meetings around this event, of course, and our CEO will be there and will play a big role there for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Super. What about Akia? Yeah, Are you going to we'll be, there? be there? Will you I will be there? I will not be there, but uh, you can be will be, I will be in Switzerland. <laughs> okay. But uh, our global CEO will be there and also the global uh, sustainability manager. We also furnish uh, part of the whole, but uh, what we are going to be there for is to commit to what uh, we have done so far and what we want to do uh, go so far. What we uh, think it's very important to say is that uh, uh, Paul was mentioning before the, this billion. We already spent 1.5 billion in the last five years, and the next billion, half will be devoted to energy saving uh, and um, uh, more efficient energy management, but the other half, more or less, will be devoted to improve the working conditions in communities. Because as I said before, things these things go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. You cannot have just uh, energy saving, because in order to prove that there is no dilemma, you need to create better working and living conditions in communities. So the 98% that you were man mentioning before is very meaningful. Let's start on this note. Thank you very much. Uh, Simona, thank you very much for all your attention. I need to mention three things before we go. Are there three? Yes, I think there are three. First thing, we are uh, meaning we are serious about uh, getting Switzerland to be a first uh, a, front, a front runner in the climate issue, and therefore we're collecting business statements. So if there is a business representative here willing to give, he, he or she obviously willing to give a statement that you are for Switzerland being a front runner in the climate issue, you are for a price on carbon, and you are, uh, again, uh, you, you are sure that there is no dilemma between economic prosperity and climate protection, please contact Anna, who, will, uh, ha who has all the equipment ready and will record your statement immediately. Five minutes later, it's gonna be on YouTube and you will be famous. So, <laughs> that is good. Second point I'd like to uh, mention, uh, as I said, uh, we, we are going to have uh, two more new climate economy events, one of them in Zurich on the finance industry, 10th of September, and the other one is in Basel on the 28th of October, and that one's focused on farm, pharmaceutical uh, industry and manufacturing, two sectors that sort of traditionally are not front runners, and therefore we address them specifically to make them front runners, at least in Switzerland. If you have colleagues who could not attend today, please tell them we'd like a full house again, and we'd like to hear, have as many ears as possible to hear the no dilemma message. And that's my last point. We now have an apéro riche for you, ready in one floor up. So go enjoy that apéro riche with no dilemma. Thank you very much. <laughs>